Uh, my friends, I just pressed the let's go live button, which means we've got to wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plain of the interwebs before we go ahead and get started. We got some business to attend to today, new filings in Florida and some brag business to attend to, but let's make sure we fire up on locals on YouTube, on Rumble, on Telegram. And it looks like things are warming up. That's tremendous news. That means we can go ahead and get started. So let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney, and today we are talking about Jack Smith, Alvin Bragg, Judge Cannon, and you'll believe it when you see it, Michael Avenatti. What the heck? Where'd this guy come from? Well, he's still in prison. He hasn't really gone anywhere because, you know, he's behind bars, but... He did call in to a news show, and he had some stuff to say about the upcoming trial, which is going to be starting with jury selection starting on Monday. We're going to be covering that, so if you're not subscribed and notified with the notification bell, please be sure to do that so that we don't miss you. But we got three segments we're going to attend to today. We're going to start with the heavy lifting first to see what's going on in Florida, because Judge Cannon came out with an order that is giving Jack Smith a victory, but she's also scolding Jack Smith. And... You know, I, this is a, I think I'd call it a technical victory. I'm not happy about the fact that we're not going to get to see a lot of this stuff, but it's, you know, just one of those things that we're not going to get to see. So we'll see, you know, it's a classified documents case. I can understand it. So we're going to go through it because Cannon scolds Jack Smith, man. She spends a couple paragraphs like, you complained about me, but every time you had an opportunity to raise these issues, you didn't do it. And even when the press came in here, and intervened. You had an opportunity to respond to them, and you didn't do it to them either, Jack. And so now, don't act like, you know, you were right from the beginning because you weren't. And she was just going by the evidence and the materials that he was submitting. So we'll go through that. We'll see what's inside. It's about 24 pages. We'll hit the highlights, and it'll give us some background on some of the components of the Florida classified documents case. And I don't think this thing is going to a trial anytime soon, to be honest, but that we're fighting over evidence and redactions and sealing. So we're talking about the, the components of the investigation, what secret service agents and the people who conducted the search warrant for the FBI and all these people, can we learn about them? Can we peer inside to what happened that led to obviously the rating of Melania's sock drawer by Jack Smith's thugs. So we'll go through that, get up to speed on what's going on in Florida. And then we got to turn our attention to New York because boy, oh boy, it sure feels like this case is going to trial starting on Monday. So get your engines warmed up, my friends, because Trump has now submitted 10 plus appeals in the state of New York and new appeals just got submitted and denied today. It's like happening lightning speed. So as I'm prepping the show, a new appeal is being filed and then denied, and another one is being filed, right? And so there are 10 plus that have happened between basically now and Monday, and there, you know, there's a delay in how these things are processed and how they're hitting the docket, and so we're not seeing them until they're actually showing up in court and arguing the motions. And so that happened today. We had the gag order appeal was denied, so that is not going to be adjourning the case, right? Trump is wanting to appeal this, saying that there is irreparable harm that's going to be happening if this case is not appealed and if the lower level trial is not stayed while the court you know, uh, works through these issues. And the courts are just saying, no, you know, there is no irreparable harm. See you in court. So we're going to go through that. We have the play-by-play -play from Klasfeld Reports, who happened to be there doing some good reporting on that. So we'll talk about him and his take on what's happening. And then our good friend, Joe Nearman, Good Logic. You know Good Logic. He's right next door on YouTube at Good Logic on the platforms, YouTube, Rumble, and elsewhere. And we'll take a look at his X on the X platform. But he today submitted an Article 78 proceeding, and he's fighting for us, my friends, for the right of the people to be able to hear 
you know, from a leading presidential candidate who is running for the Oval Office, kind of an important moment in American history. Wouldn't it be nice if we could hear from Trump? One of the key issues in 2024 is going to be about our justice system. Trump happens to be very familiar with the justice system because he is on the receiving end of their weaponization and their partisan prosecution against him. So if he has a take on that, literally the First Amendment is saying, hey, you speak out about that. Petition your government for a redress of grievances. Tell the public at large about the malfeasance that's happening here. And then they can come to your aid. How do they do that? By voting. If we think Trump is an insurrectionist, the country thinks that he's, you know, somebody who should not be in, in the office, they can vote that way. But the Democrats don't want to do that. They'd rather him be removed from the ballot so the voices can be, you know, our, our participation can be taken away and then gag him as they are violating his constitutional rights. Anyways, I digress. Good logic said a lot of that and much, much more in a much more articulate and intelligent way. And he has submitted that in the New York court. So he'll be talking about that and we'll uh, throw his link in the chat and we'll uh, throw it in the description to make sure that you know where to find him. But he'll be covering that later on his channel. I want to make sure we said that right at the outset. So Go follow that. I think this is a very, very important issue. And he's a member of the press there in New York. So he's petitioning on behalf of the press. So it's going to be a lot of fun to see how that goes. And so shout out and and, uh, ultra, you know, MAGA uh, energy coming your way. Good logic on behalf of the people. So we got that. We got uh, James Trusty, former Trump lawyer, also talking about how things are going to be going when the trial gets underway. And then we're going to listen to this whole segment, man, because this was a pretty wild exchange. We'll skip forward, you know, fast forward a little bit from the beginning. But Avenatti, remember him? Michael Avenatti, been convicted. He is currently in prison. He called in to, I think it was NBC News, and he was explaining his take on this trial and how it's not the right trial. It's not the right time. Doesn't feel legitimate. He wrote back in 2018 that it was legitimate, but that was back in 2018 you know, back when all of this was ripe and back before Michael Cohen was a convicted perjurer and had openly admitted in court that he lied again during his plea deal and before Stormy Daniel changed her story, right? So a lot of things have changed over the years and so his position has changed. And so we'll see what he says, says this case is ridiculous. Trump actually retruthed him over there. He's like, you know, Michael Avenatti's making some sense these days. Donald Trump posted that. And then we have this Stormy Daniels letter that is percolating back again. And of course, this letter is real. Even the AP confirms this. And so we'll just refresh our recollections on this. We've talked about this before. But the letter is real. Okay, Stormy Daniels denies there was a relationship at all in the first place. And Avenatti is going to talk to us about maybe she was kind of blackmailing the Trump organization back in 2015, 16, before the election even came underway. So we're going to get into that. Trump had a truth and another truth. We'll see what he had to say. And of course, then we'll hear from you, my friends, and get your takes on all of the things that are happening out there and more. And so we are grateful that you are here and with us today. We also had a great members only stream this morning over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And this is where we have a little bit you know, more casual streams when we're just kind of getting our day started here and poking around, seeing what the news has in store for us, talking about Joe Biden and whatever he's up to, some of the 2024 election stuff, polls, Trump campaign activity, Biden campaign activity, demented AOC, the rest of the stuff. So come join us. We go live 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, five days a week, six days a week. We also do that on Saturday. So come join us. You can find a lot of that same stuff by becoming a membo on the YouTubes as well. And if you're on Locals, you get the whole community. You get to post stories. You get to meet people, leave comments, and it's a lot of fun. So come and join us over there. Links in the description below. We've also got our website. So if you ever want to check out any PDFs, if you want to sign up for our daily newsletter, if you want to get the calendar or read show reports about the various segments, that's where you go. RobertGovea.com. A lot of good stuff over there. And then I'll invite you to come join us. Links on this one are also in the description to WatcherLodge.com. We're focusing on sovereignty and self-development. So if you're interested in some other, you know, not necessarily political stuff, but in response to the political environment, right? We're in this political environment and things are messy out there. So what do we do as a result? Okay, so what, right? The country seemingly is coming apart. So what do we do about it? That's what we're talking about at the Lodge. 
and we're building our community there. We'd love to see you, know you, see where you're doing, see where you're from, see what you're up to. Come join us. Sovereignty Saturday. Links are down in the description below. And don't forget to get your new shirts from our shop on YouTube. Travis Matthew Polos, grab them from Nordstrom's, Nordstrom Rack. I think Walmart has some good deals on them. So I linked a bunch of stuff up in the shopping box. And hopefully you'll find something you like that you deserve because you need to look good, especially while you're watching the show. Get your polos on. It's a polo revolution, okay? We're saving America by being better looking than the left, more proper and, and dignified, all right? So come check it. Thanks for checking it out. And of course, any one of those ways is a great way to support our show and all the work that we do here, and we're grateful for it. All right. So now, without any further ado, let's get into it. Judge Cannon in Florida rips Jack Smith, says, Jack, you should have brought this up many times before. You didn't, and because you didn't, I could have just dismissed your request right now and denied your motion, but I'm not going to do that because I am, in fact, a very reasonable judge. Now, the left likes to go hysterical over Judge Cannon because she's a reasonable person. They expect all of them to be like Ariola Angeron, who just banishes Trump into the seventh circle. But Cannon's not going to do that. And we're having a debate now. This is the classified documents case in Florida about evidence. And as the public, as the American people, we want to see what the heck's going on in this case, because they say Trump was in possession of all these heinous documents and so on and so forth. And there was this really dramatic investigation where the FBI had to go raid Melania's underwear. And they were telling us on late night TV and everything that Trump had nuclear codes that he was selling to Iran and all that garbage. You remember that all fake news. So Cannon is now having to weigh a couple of questions in this case. We have discovery that is being disclosed from the government to the defense. And the defense is saying, we'd like to, you know, kind of talk about some of these names, some of these people who are involved. We want to show you what, some, what, what they're talking about and who is connecting the dots. And we don't know why they might want to show us that, but we can suspect that it's probably because those names would be readily identifiable and we might be able to concoct, you know, one of those yarned uh, connection dots. Oh, we see the big collusion conspiracy now coming to play, being orchestrated by the Biden administration. So we're asking ourselves, right, what can we see? What can we not see? Judge Cannon came out with an order on this and she rips Jack Smith. It's going to take a little while to warm up this, this one. She gives us some background that we'll dive into, but then she goes into Jack, laces into him pretty hard. So stick with it and it will get juicy. Now on this date, April 9th, filed in the West Palm Beach Division, Southern District of Florida, cases United States of America versus Trump and the other co-defendants. This is Judge Eileen Cannon writing. All right, everybody, here's why we're here. We're here on two motions. One, Jack Smith is asking the court to reconsider. Okay, so Cannon came out with an order saying that a lot of this stuff's going to be public. We read a lot of these filings here. And if you want to get caught up on those, they're all on our channel. Jack says, please reconsider, because if you do publicize this stuff, it's going to be the end of America. We know his standard line. And also, this is Trump's motion for leave to actually disclose the discovery. Right? Trump wants to publicize this. And so every time that you hear someone on the left say, Trump doesn't want the public to see what's happening here. You know, you just refer him to this video, okay, to today's show. Just say, hey, dumb dumb, look at this one. Trump literally files motions to disclose the discovery. Like, do you see that? Can you read that? Because that's what he's asking for, to, to share this with us. Same thing with Mershon's case. He wants to also have the records publicized, the judge's emails and so on. But they all deny that because they don't want us to see it. So Jack says, don't dis disclose it. Now, Cannon says, okay, both motions concern sealing requests that are associated with Trump's motion to compel discovery. And we've talked about many of those motions as well. We're, we're spending some time on this. It'll make, so it helps make sense of what we're actually talking about here. But remember, Trump also in this case said, your honor, there's a bunch of other material that we need from other entities like the NSA, Secret Service, Homeland Security. We, we got like a little sliver of the FBI. We need everybody else. We need DOJ, all these divisions. We need, right, like they wanted everything from all of the government entities because they're all related to classified documents, right? They're all involved in that process. And Jack Smith was like, um, uh, no, we're just going to give you like what I worked on on that one Saturday with Jay Brett, right? So the 
disclosure from the government, Jack Smith is arguing, is just you know a fraction of what Trump is asking for. So they said, okay, judge, why don't you compel Jack to go get it? Go like literally go to the CIA. The CIA was on the list, right? Oh, it's classified. CIA says it's all, all top secret or whatever. So if they're involved in this, if they're in the conversation about what is or not is or not is not classified, then we need to be apprised of those communications. So the parties filed their motion. Judge Cannon heard oral arguments that was over a month ago on March 1st. And here's what the judge says. So Cannon writes, upon hearing this motion, Jack Smith's motion for reconsideration to redact and to seal some of this information is granted in part. So we'll see what's granted and what's not. Now, Trump's motion for leave to disclose discovery is also granted in part. Okay, so it's kind of like both sides get a little bit here. So the judge is going to catch us up. And I think this will give us a nice background on where we're at with all of the discovery in this case. And this is a very, you know, discovery heavy case because we're talking about boxes of documents. So here is what Judge Cannon says. She says, all right, it's a little bit lengthy, so let's go to it. She says, here's the motion to compel discovery. Right. We're going to call that the MTC, not to be confused with the motion to continue. It's a motion to compel. Now, she says, all right, here's the deal. On January 16th, earlier this year, Trump filed multiple motions to compel. We read a lot of these. We're like, yes, let's go, Trump. Go get those documents, baby. Oh, yeah. Now, in the motion to compel, Trump sought an order defining the scope of the prosecution team because Jack Smith said it was like just him and his bro. We're like, oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. You got like the whole stinking government involved in this. Okay. So we want all of it. So they also wanted to compel Jack Smith to produce various categories of evidence. That's Brady material, Giglio material, stuff that might exonerate Trump. And Trump also attached numerous exhibits in support of their motion to compel, some of which are documents that were produced by Jack Smith in discovery. All right. So Jack Smith gave them stuff and they say, oh, look at this. This means we need more like supplemental materials. And Jack is giving us a hint that there's something else there, right? It's like, oh, I I know it's referring to something. So what is that? We need that. And others consist of materials that the Trump team got pursuant from FOIA requests, right? So Jack like, like inadvertently alerted them to it. And then Trump went around Jack and got it through FOIA. So then he knows he's like, oh, there's a bunch more here. So consistent with the protective order, Trump then filed a motion to compel to make Jack Smith get all of their stuff. He filed it on the public docket and in partially redacted form, right? So he's he's showing us kind of what's coming. Now, they also filed, not only on the public docket, they filed a motion for leave to file their motion to compel in unredacted form with limited exceptions, saying, hey, these are presumptively public records, right? This is, we're all going, yes, let's go. Like, we want to see this. Who... What is being redacted here, right? They're fighting hard over this. Trump's saying, can we please publicize this, please? Now here, defendant's motion to compel, this is from Trump, as well as the associated reply and response are accompanied by extensive classified supplements, right? We can't see any of that, much to our chagrin. Now, neither defendant's nor the press coalition seek to unseal the classified supplements, right? So stuff that is already marked classified, they're not saying, let us see that. This stuff is, this is just like regular investigatory stuff. You know, they're not saying there's 34 illegal classified documents, they say, or whatever the number was. They're not saying let's unseal all of that. This is just regular investigatory stuff. So, or, or we'll see, right? I mean, Trump is saying it's, let, let us see it. It's presumptively public. Now, we'll see what the judge says. Now, the operative blanket protective order extends to all discovery. And all of the approximately, the judge says, 1.3 million pages of unclassified discovery in this case have been designated by Jack Smith as subject to the protective order. All right. So we don't get to see anything. Trump can't share anything. So the classified stuff, obviously, we're not getting. Okay, we say, all right, that's just, I guess, the cost of the national security state, which I think is ridiculous and way overbroad, obviously. Now, all of the approximately 1.3 million unclassified. So you say, okay, fine. If it's classified, we don't need to see it. Uh, You know, yay, NSA, CIA, whatever. But what about the unclassified stuff? Can you please upload that to uh, Dropbox, please, so we can download that on a Google Drive? Thanks. 
uh, no. Now that's all protected by the protective order. How come? And even Trump's motions need to be redacted. Now the judge continues and says, Jack Smith filed a brief in response, a generalized response to Trump's motion for leave for permission to file this stuff. And he called it a seal request. And in that seal request, Jack Smith opposed unsealing the motion to compel, right? Trump is saying, I need this from the NSA. I need this from the Secret Service. I need this from CIA, uh, whatever. And he says, no, we can't unseal any of that. Here's, here's a couple things we need to protect. We got to protect the identity of any potential government witness. So I don't know how broad that is. We also have to limit anything that reveals personal identifying information for any potential government witness. And so you might think of things like uh, addresses, cell phone numbers, emails, which is usually, you know, okay, fine. And three, also want anything that constitutes Jenks Act material for potential government witnesses. So these are notes, memos, uh, you know, any materials that they rely on in their testimony. Now the seal request from Jack Smith Judge Cannon is writing this. She's saying, okay, hey, dumb, dumb Jack. This did not, when you submitted this seal, you did not propose a legal framework to govern these requests. You just said, this is what we want to do. And you did not provide any factual support for that relief. You just said, this is what we need to do. And so Trump took no position on any particular request, but he argued that Jack Smith's generalized and vague claims failed to provide any sufficient factual or legal basis for the relief that was requested. And we read that here. We're going, what is he talking about? Like, why does he need to do all of this? And he just kept saying, well, Trump's dangerous, you know, and, and if people know about this, then there's going to be danger. And we said, well, okay, well, that's, that's just the generic catch-all phrase. You don't just get to invoke danger, you know, and then suddenly everything that you want to be sealed is now kept out of the public eye and out of public scrutiny. That's what, what kind of standard is that? So why, Jack? So then, right now, this is back and forth. Now, the judge is saying it's not just like uh, me versus Trump either. It says also the press jumped in because when Jack was trying to keep, like, the press wants to see this, right? The press wants to see a lot of this stuff. If they could bring cameras into the Bragg trial, they'd do it. If they could cram them into federal court for Cannon's proceedings and for Chutkin's, they'd do it. But Jack Smith, right, is oppositional even to the press. And the press are so cowardly that they will not call him out on this. Saying, well, wh why is Jack Smith burying all this stuff? It's unclassified, right? Let us see it. Well, they know why, because it's, it's a fake prosecution, ultimately. And they don't hold their side accountable, only the other side. So the press coalition, they ultimately filed this. Now, that, and then my point is they don't report it, right? So like they'll file in court to like get some action action on this, but then they'll come out and you'll hear guys like Weissman on with Maddow or Saki saying Trump is just trying to delay this so that the public doesn't see it. No, actually, he wants to literally open it up as much as we can. His attorney in New York is posting the filings on his own website because the court won't do it. The defense has to do it. So on January 22nd, the press coalition they also filed a motion to intervene and to unseal defendant's motion to compel discovery. The press coalition argued, citing authorities, that Trump's motion to compel, so this is Jack's, this is the press, are presumptively public records subject to the First Amendment's qualification, qualified right of access, right? So they're saying Trump filed a motion to compel and we should see it. We don't need a bunch of redactions on there. It's just stand, like by default. Now, both sides responded to the press coalition motion. Trump largely took issue with their representation about Trump's responsiveness for conferral. The press was like, well, we tried to confer with Trump and they delayed. And they're like, we didn't delay for crap. You guys delayed. And, you know, that's it. But they didn't fight about anything that was ultimately relevant. Now, at some point, we see that Jack Smith, later on February 2nd, Jack Smith moved to file sealed and redacted documents, and that motion largely incorporated some other motions as well. So Jack Smith responded, and he argued that the press coalition failed to establish the elements of intervention. Okay, so Jack is not responding ultimately to the issue, right? Like, this is Jack Smith, and this is going to come back. The judges, this is a cop-out, right? Jack 
says, well, we're not going to respond to the press's First Amendment issues about why there's a presumption of access to Trump's filings. They just say they don't have a right to intervene under the federal rules of procedure. So sorry. You know, it's just a technicality. It's like you don't have standing. Remember that? Rewind the clock back to our standing uh, trauma days when every court was like standing. Let's, you, know, you don't have any standing. And we covered that in 2020. But same type of thing is happening here, right? The special counsel's office is just saying they don't have standing to intervene. And they didn't respond. The court notes this. They, the special counsel's response did not object to the press coalition's invocation of First Amendment principles. Didn't say there was anything wrong with that. Just say they don't have standing, essentially. Did not meaningfully engage with any of the legal standards and did not offer any additional factual support. Okay, so now, Jack, you've had two bites at the apple on this thing, man. And you have failed both times. And then the judge came out and said, okay, like if you don't object to the press and your prior motion is just vague and you know largely meaningless about a danger to uh, you know the case or whatever, there's nothing there. So the court says, well, against that backdrop of that preceding history in the record, then the court came out, issued two orders authorizing the sealing of personal identifying information, but otherwise requiring that Trump's motion to compel and the attached exhibits be filed in unredacted form. And we were very excited about that. Oh, perfect. And again, I don't mind this personal identifying information stuff. You know, there's this law of big numbers. If there's a bunch of people that get access to someone's email, right? Just a, like, like, let's say, you know, a hundred million people, somebody might send an email, right? Just, you know, on average, hey, yeah, you know, let's send an email to that guy, right? Sends an email, something else. So, you, okay, just like, let, let's leave that out. So you don't have to worry about that. I'm fine with that, but we need to know like who these, you know, I, I think it's appropriate to know who these people are if they're government investigators and they're part of the in inquiry, like that's the scrutiny. That's part of the public oversight over all of this stuff. We don't want them doing this under the dark of night. Now they can do that for their investigation, but the investigation's over. Okay. They've got their little notes written, their little reports done. It's all codified. Go there. So it's done. So now we can scrutinize it. Now we can talk about who the people were in the case. That's the right to confront your accuser. It's the confrontation clause that we used to care about in this country. Now Trump can't even talk about it. So they say, judge says, guided by the strong presumption of public access to criminal proceedings. This is Judge Cannon, which is true, unless you're Jack Smith, who doesn't care about that. The court applied the unobjected to First Amendment standard noting that neither party argues that the First Amendment does not apply to this, right? So Jack is just kind of sitting on his hands. So under this standard, you know, the First Amendment, along with the well-established rules governing public access in the district, this court determined that Jack Smith has not set forth a sufficient factual basis, Jack, or legal basis warranting deviation from the strong presumption of public access to the records. Thank you. Right now she's going to reverse a lot of this, so we'll see. But the order also set deadlines for the sealed submissions of the other parties to review prior to public docket docketing, right? So then Jack turned around and asked for reconsideration. So, you know, catching up, Jack Smith had an opportunity to say, I object. He didn't do it. Neither time. Judge said, okay, well, uh, First Amendment then seems like it, it, weigh, it outweighs the non-objection, and so we'll go ahead and unseal this. Jack was unhappy about that, so he turned around and said, whoa, you have to reconsider this. So on February 8th, just not long ago, Jack Smith filed an instant motion that we're talking about here, a motion for reconsideration. Judge, you made a mistake, please do it over. Jack Smith argues that one, Judge Cannon clearly erred in applying the First Amendment standard to the seal request, which are instead governed by Rule 16 and a different good cause standard. So I guess Rule 16 uh, overrides the First Amendment. Huh? And reconsideration is warranted to prevent a, quote, manifest injustice. And Cannon's like, okay, gosh. So here is what she says. Now she's about to get irritated here. Now, unlike Jack Smith's initial seal request that we talked about in the first instance, the motion for reconsideration from Jack actually proposes a legal standard this time 
and provides, you know, some factual support that was missing the first time. And that filing is sealed. So Trump responded and Trump argued that the newly raised arguments and the evidence cannot serve as the basis for reconsideration, saying, sorry, judge, you already decided. And Trump also argued that Judge Cannon did apply the correct standard and they distinguished the cases, right? So Cannon is showing we can't see this, it's sealed, but she's telling us what happened in it. So Trump then distinguished the cases in the motion from the circumstances here. So she's, Trump says, well, Jack Smith cited all this case law, but those were weird cases. Those were cases that mattered in you know, uh, a criminal context for this person who was a foreign spy, not a president or something. So Judge Cannon gives us this. Okay, so now all of these other things have been submitted. She's reviewed them. She says, okay. Now, in light of Jack Smith's motion for reconsideration, she read it. The court stayed the deadlines that came out previously. And at the court's instruction, Trump then filed a notice about their then forthcoming motion to compel reply. And in that reply, Trump's defense was proposing that they could do this. One, publicly file all portions of the motion to compel reply that don't reference discovery. So again, Trump's like, can we please put this on the docket publicly so we can all see it? Which we would love because we like to read these funds. But also two, Trump said that they would confer with Jack Smith about the discovery that they seek to disclose. Like what do they want to publish? And if necessary, they could then seek leave to file a redacted version of their motion to compel reply. So we'll talk to Jack. If Jack wants to white something out or redact something, we'll consider it. And the court approved this proposal. So on February 9th, Trump filed all portion of the motion to continue reply that did not reference the discovery, which is what Jack Smith's freaking out about. That's the actual you know, evidence in the case, emails, notes, <clears throat> and other materials. Now on February 15th, Trump filed the instant motion for leave, right? So Trump says, okay, we're going to have this conversation about what can we, we can publicize, what we cannot publicize. So Trump says, all right, we've, we've conferred, we've met, here's what we got. Your Honor, we would like permission to disclose this discovery. They identified four categories of material that they want to disclose. So what are we talking about? Here is what Trump wants to disclose. These are the following materials. First, a search warrant application for defendant De Oliveira's Gmail account. And we've reviewed several search warrants here, including the search warrant that was initially launched in this case that was created by Bruce Reinhardt, I think is his name. And he submitted, uh, we got the, you know, the limited uh, cover sheets and some basic documents about that. So what about all of the underlying, you know, affidavits and filings that led to that, in this case, not for Trump, but for De Oliveira. So Trump wants that publicized. Jack does not. They also want grand jury testimony of an FBI special agent and a Secret Service agent concerning the thoroughness of the August 8th search of Mar-a-Lago. That was the day of the raid. They also want U.S. Secret Service an email chain shown to the Secret Service agent during the grand jury testimony described above. And they want a Mar-a-Lago floor plan and security memo that was also prepared by the U.S. Secret Service. And maybe that, that memo shows, you know, this place was very secure. All of this was locked down. This was not something to be freaking out about. Trump had the documents secured because they were his documents. Now, in the alternative, Trump and the defense, they seek permission to file a redacted copy of their supplement and the exhibits on the public docket and an unredacted copy under seal. Now, Jack Smith filed a response opposing the material's public disclosure. Again, doesn't want any of this to be seen for the same reason as before. What does Jack say? Oh, yeah, witness safety, infecting witness testimony or infecting the jury pool and protecting privacy interests. Now, we had a March 1st hearing. On March 1, 2024, the court heard argument on Jack Smith's motion for reconsideration. And in addition to those presentations, the court also heard argument from the press as a non-party. Now, they give us some legal standards on what intervening is and how a motion for reconsideration works. We'll fast forward through that. And here is what Judge Cannon tells us in the ruling. She says, all right, so here's the deal. So Jack Smith 
now seeks reconsideration of this, saying, I was wrong. Okay. Says, Jack Smith says that the court was clearly wrong, clearly erred in applying the First Amendment standard to the seal requests. And these are properly governed by Rule 16. And Jack also says that this needs to be reconsidered to prevent a manifest injustice. Cannon's like, ah, oh, gosh. Namely, protecting potential witnesses and integrity of the proceedings. So upon full review, the court says, we ultimately elect to consider Jack Smith's new arguments, and we do reconsider our prior rulings. And so we're going to grant Jack's ruling, in part, reasoning as follows. Now here's where she says, before I get into this, let's have a conversation, Jack. As a preliminary point, Jack, the arguments and the evidence that actually came through in your motion, Jack, they could have and they should have been raised in prior filings. And because they were not, denial of this motion would be appropriate on that basis alone. We could be done right now. You're lucky I'm even listening to this, right? If I was Judge Cannon or I was Angeron or Judge Kaplan, that would have been the end of it. You didn't bring it up, we're done. In fact, we already have a situation like this with Judge Mershon, Murkan. He's the guy in the Stormy Cohen case, the judge who is, is not allowing Trump to file motions because he should have filed it before. Remember that? Denied. Sorry, not timely. Should have brought it up earlier. Judge Cannon is not doing that. And the left still turns himself into a pretzels because they're so agitated that she is not doing their bidding. Now, as provided above, this is saying that motions to reconsider, like Jack, they cannot be used to relitigate old matters. You can't raise new arguments in these. You can't present new evidence that could have been raised before. I already entered judgment. Now, the special counsel had two opportunities, Jack, to raise these arguments, and you failed to do so in both instances. Now, your initial seal request failed to offer a governing standard or legal framework, and you provided no factual support for the relief that you sought. Instead, Jack, you only contain conclusory and unsubstantiated assertions about witness safety. Okay, we were saying the same thing here. We're going, what the heck is he talking about? The integrity of the proceedings, whatever that means, and the privacy interests of certain people. We're going, what? So you could say that in any case, anywhere, all the time. Now, later, in response to the press coalition motion, when Jack should have corrected the record, the special counsel, again, failed to engage with, let alone even refute their argument that the First Amendment attaches to these materials, that we get to see it as the public. Now, instead, the special counsel focused solely on the elements of intervention under the rules of civil procedure. And only now, only now, Jack, after failing to meaningfully raise the arguments on present evidence, could have been raised that could have been raised you could have brought it up but you didn't now after you've lost now jack smith moves for reconsideration and argues in no uncertain terms that the court committed clear error oh she's not happy about this this is like by applying an unobjected to legal standard judges like you piece of this is very you know she's very mad right now She's like on level nine. You may not feel it, but you can feel it. You, you can probably feel it. Now, the same is true of the special counsel's manifest injustice claim. She's like, idiot. If she could put idiot in here, she would. Of the idiotic manifest injustice claim. She's putting it in quotes like, you're dumb. Your manifest injustice claim. Okay, let's look at that, Jack. The factual support that underlies this claim, the basis for the assertion, that the disclosure of witness identities could subject them to threats or intimidation and harassment, that was re meaningfully developed for the very first time in the motion to reconsider itself. Now, indeed, as the court's order already determined, the special counsel's initial seal request failed to provide the court adequate support to grant relief sought. Cannon saying, I did my job. I reviewed what you put in front of me and you put in front of me crap. That's why I didn't rule in your favor. Now she's like being, you know, generous. Okay. I'll look at it again. Now, although substantiated witness safety 
and intimidation concerns can support a valid basis for overriding the strong presumption of public access, Jack Smith's sparse and undifferentiated response fails to provide the court with a factual basis. You don't just get to dump out platitudes in your filings, Jack. This remains true even if the court had applied Rule 16 good cause, which still requires a specific showing. And this is to say nothing of Jack Smith's failure to comply with this district's local rules on sealing as well, which the court has emphasized repeatedly throughout this proceeding. Oh, she's pest. Whoa. Look, she cited four different docket numbers. Oh, <laughs> electronic court filing. Oh, man. Oh, she's fuming mad. She's like level nine out of 10. She says, hey, I've warned you about these local rules, Jack. Four times. She had to go back, or she told her clerk or somebody, go back, find all the times I've warned them about this. It's okay, uh, docket 41, 48, 228, 231. She's like listing them out. You know you're in trouble when she's got a list, okay? You're in big trouble. So now this served as another independent basis for denial. Now affirming denial, right? So I could have just denied this motion. Right? You are not following the rules. If she was Mershon, this would have been denied, obviously. If she was Chutkin, would have been denied. But she's an actual judge who's actually you know, not a partisan hack. Now, this was affirming another denial and so on. Here's the, here's the quote. We'll fast forward through that. But here she continues. She says, all right, listen. Jack, you're a moron. You should have this motion denied because you didn't follow the rules. You didn't bring this argument up. You are accusing the court of manifest injustice when you didn't even bring up a response or a claim in, in any, you didn't even challenge it when the press submitted or when Trump was submitting it. So how about you, you know, finish it with your own uh, language there. But she says, okay, nevertheless, now, because this judge is not a partisan hack, she says, I have considered with this, and here is what I'm entitling, entitled to do. She says, although the record is clear that Jack Smith could have and should have raised its current arguments previously, Judge Cannon is a benevolent judge. The court elects upon a full review of the new arguments to reconsider, and having done so, here's the bottom line. The 11th Circuit has not addressed this question, which is whether in a criminal proceeding, the First Amendment qualified right of access, whether the First Amendment attaches to discovery or attached in support of a publicly filed Rule 12b motion to compel discovery under Rule 16. So can you see the discovery materials themselves or can you see the motion that was filed referencing the discovery materials? Now, because the 11th Circuit has not addressed this, nevertheless, the most faithful application of Supreme Court precedent and available 11th Circuit authority is that the motion to compel in this case is not uh, subject to a public right of access, whether constitutional or common law, because it is still ultimately a discovery motion as distinct from a, dis a substantive pretrial motion that requires judicial resolution. And so she says, I draw this conclusion from another case where the discovery is not act is subject to public review and saying that there's a distinction here that derives from experience and logic tests from SCOTUS. So saying, if we apply all this, the court agrees with Jack Smith's new position that the discovery materials that are referenced in here take on the character of a motion here, which is related to a discovery motion, which does not enable the public the right to access. Now, none of this is to say that this is clear cut or straightforward. The special counsel's position depends on an extension of Chicago to this but as all parties observe, there's a, a, a distinct distinction here between civil and criminal cases. And so we can't ignore this distinction. And secondly, and more granularly, the 11th Circuit criminal cases also support, these are also distinguishable as well. 
saying that the public might have some you know, access rights in some instances. Now, as the motion to compel and the filings indicate, Trump primarily seeks a judicially enforced definition of the prosecution team, along with a ruling that Trump have produced to them some evidence tending to show the existence of the essential elements of their selective and their vindictive prosecution claims. Now, these embedded scope of prosecution team and selective and vindictive prosecution questions, says Cannon, related to broader questions of due process and bias and animus. They give the motion to compel a decidedly different flavor than a garden variety discovery standing, making the access inquiry murkier. Okay, so she's saying, look, there is like, it's a discovery battle, but it's also more than that. It's also showing that in the battle for the discovery, we are having difficulty accessing evidence which is evidence in and of itself of a biased prosecution, selective, vindictive prosecution. Okay, they're not giving us access, they're hiding access, and that shows their corruption and their animus. So that makes the analysis murky. So she says, look, now not the still developing, notwithstanding this, these are muddled questions raised in this criminal case, but the court determines for the reason stated that there is no right of access to the disputed discovery material referenced in the motion to compel. Now the court therefore applies a good cause standard set forth to the categories of information below. And here's what we say. This evaluation balances relevant factors. Here's the judge. Now we're gonna, rel- we're gonna balance the safety of witnesses and third parties, danger of perjury or witness intimidation, protection of information vital to national security and the protection of business enterprise from economic reprisals, you know, adverse a- actions. So the special counsel says the good cause burden rep- rests with the defense. The court disagrees and saying, if we apply this here, if we apply the standard here, this is what the court is going to do. So Jack Smith, when it comes to witness identities, Jack Smith seeks to redact from Trump's motion to compel and exhibits information that reveals the identity, right? No identities of any government witnesses. Jack says, no, if we publicize their identities, then they could be subject to threats, to intimidation and to harassment, also to scrutiny, to oversight, to research, to investigation, but they don't want that. So Jack Smith offers examples of threats and concerning communications that judicial officers got like, you know, Angeron or Chutkin or Cannon. Cannon had somebody who was even arrested for this. And law enforcement agents connected with proceedings like the search of Trump's home and other things. So Jack also filed under seal evidence related to a government witness by a non-party referenced cited in the motion. Now, Jack Smith acknowledges that no defendant in this case has done witness intimidation, and that all defendants are subject to a no contact order that has generated no activity in this case, right? So the defendants are following the rules. No one's breaking the law. No one's doing anything bad there, obviously. So Cannon says, now, although Jack Smith's request remains sweeping in nature as applied to all government witnesses without differentiation, and although the court was unable to locate another high profile case in public records where the court granted a broad pretrial request to seal all the identities as sought here, the court satisfied that Jack Smith has made an adequate showing, at least at this juncture, pending final trial preparations. Now the court directs Jack Smith to file under seal an index containing the name of each potential witness and a corresponding pseudonym or anonymization for use in the motion, right? So the names will be gone out of there, which, you know, kind of stinks, but okay. So personal identifying information. This one I had less of a problem with. Now, Jack Smith and Trump, right? Even Trump is requesting redactions. Okay. The court previously granted this request. No party challenges it now. So therefore, consistent with this, we'll do that. Redaction of personally identifying information is okay. Now, how about witness statements? Now, as for the third category, Jack Smith argues, he says, in what is characterized as a part of a narrow set of seal requests, he says, he says it's narrow, no, the wholesale and the undifferentiated pretrial sealing of all information that he says is Jenks Act material for government witnesses. And Jenks Act material is 
material that the witness will rely on or testify to or use in their testimony. So the special counsel contends that this information should remain sealed because of witness safety, not to influence witness testimony. And in response, Trump says, there's no case supporting this position. Upon review, the court grants that in limited part. They say the court finds good cause to redact limited portions of the material that could identify them, right? So it, it is in sync with the prior order. Limited redactions, like professional titles, detailed biographical background information that could identify them, you know, personal identifying information, other specific stuff, sealing this, supported by the same witness safety rationale, and it supports the idea if we're going to redact their names, we should redact, you know, their resume. The parties are directed to meaningfully confer and redact all of this. And then lastly, or remaining, the court reaches a different conclusion about the request to seal the substance of all the statements. So Jack wanted everything limited, but they say, no, that's too broad. The court does not find that Jack Smith's generalized witness and jury pool influence concerns are enough to establish good cause to categorically seal all of this. So in light of the strong presumption of public access, the court declines to seal everything. Now to date, Jack Smith has had multiple opportunities to provide factual and legal support for the contention that generalized witness and jury pool influence concerns justify a blanket sealing of all witness statements. None has been provided yet. All Jack Jenks request support included in the motion is operated, offered as a justification to witness safety. And so the good cause showing is inadequate and the request is generalized. It's undifferentiated. And so we're not going to apply it to all witnesses, regardless of substance, context, or role. The court has found no analog for this type of request, which arises in a case involving a lengthy speaking indictment that generously references and quotes from a variety of non-defendant statements. So as for legal authority, Jack Smith's cases do not lend support for this request and the court's independent research does not support this request. And so we're not going to be having a categorical ceiling of all the substance. So in sum, Cannon says the court finds that Jack Smith has made sufficient good cause to show that there are some redactions justified for information in substantive statements that could be used to identify the people. If you're confident it's going to not identify them, that's fine, but we're not doing a wholesale limitation and redaction of everything. Now, Jack also identifies documents that contain additional discrete sensitive information in other categories. And as in the court's initial order, the court finds that national security concerns are sufficient to warring the ceiling of the signal intelligence subcompartments that are redacted in the indictment. Additionally, Jack requests that the FBI code name of a separate investigation and other uncharged conduct not be mentioned. What could that be? A separate investigation. I wonder what that one is. Hmm. Like crossfire hurricane or something? I don't know. The court determines that law enforcement and third party privacy interests are sufficient to justify these redactions. And finally, unlike Jack's request, vis a vis Trump's substantive motions, the seal request does not seek the redaction of the ancillary names. But nonetheless, for consistency, we're not going to be identifying people and we authorize the sealing of this. Now, in their leave for motion to disclose the discovery, Trump wants to disclose other materials. Jack Smith opposes those materials, the ones that we reviewed previously. Each is discussed below. Trump wanted to release the search warrant. Jack Smith opposes that. Now, consistent with the holdings, the court directs Trump to redact from these materials what we talked about, the PII, the Jenks material, and anything that might identify, but it sounds like otherwise we're going to see some of that. Grand jury testimony. Second, Jack Smith opposes the disclosure of grand jury testimony about an FBI agent and a Secret Service agent. He says those should be sealed. They're protected. Now, consistent with this, the court does find good cause to seal this material. So we're not going to see it. Trump should redact grand jury testimony, so that exchange, from their supplement and do not put them in the public filing. Bummer. 
Secret Service email chain. Are we getting this one? Third, the special counsel opposes disclosure of a Secret Service email chain. They call it paradigmatic Jenks Act material. Says it has to be sealed. Trump intends to reference and quote these emails insofar as they relate to the, the thoroughness of the search. Now, Trump is directed to redact any identifying information. And lastly, the floor plan. They say Jack Smith opposes a memo that was prepared by the Secret Service that was a floor plan of, of Mar-a-Lago. The court finds good cause for sealing this. Why? National security. Law enforcement justifications. Don't want anyone to know what it looks like. And so Trump is directed to redact all of that. And so it is hereby ordered and a judge, granted in part, denied in part, and the judge is setting some deadlines here, okay? By April 15th, we have Jack Smith, who's been ordered to create an index of the witnesses, meaningfully confer about redactions of Jenks Act material, meaningfully confer about you know what's going on, the public docket, and signed by the judge, Judge Cannon in Florida. So a little bit of a bummer. You know, this is stuff that we all like to see. We'd like to see basically everything if we could get our hands on it and we'd read it if we could. But uh, she's trying to balance this thing out. And, you know, we have no idea what they're talking about or what the documents look like. So it is a bummer. But you can see Jack Smith got a very serious dressing down there. And his hysterics are not tolerated in Judge Cannon's courtroom. And quite frankly, right, she is, a, 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 I would say, more of a middle of the judge road. But if she wanted to be a, you know, ultra Trumper, like somebody like the opposite of Judge Chutkin or Judge Angeron or Judge Kaplan or Judge Murkon or any of these other judges, she could have just disposed of this immediately, right, and shown us what we wanted to see. But she's not doing that. So we're going to see what continues to happen on this. Of course, we'll uh, see what some of those documents look like. I can't wait to see some of those chains if we can get our hands on some of the secret service stuff or whatever we're going to get our hands on we'll be here covering it and so thank you for subscribing my friends wherever it is you're watching this we're covering all of the trump litigation all of the 2024 litigation i expect more ballot removal you know stuff happening if they can get their hands on you know another opportunity to do that congressional legislation whatever's going on we're going to be covering it we'd love to have you join us as we do thank you so much for subscribing for liking this video wherever you're watching it, for sharing our channel, our content, a short video or a segment with a friend or family member. That way they can see what's happening behind the scenes in these cases and come join us when we have some fun here on the live streams. We got a great members only community watching the watchers.locals.com. We do streams in the morning, Saturday streams, and we have a great group of people. We'd love to have you come join us and say hello. Great way to support the show and have some fun doing it. Links all down in the description below. We'll see you over there and back here on the next one. All right, my friends. Now, that is what we're talking about in Florida. But now we got to hop on an airplane, go up north and land in New York and see what's going on in the Bragg, prosec Bragg prosecution because we got a lot of activity happening today. Donald Trump continues to fight the Bragg prosecution, and now we see that he's filed what some say are as many as 10 plus appeals trying to get the court to just offer him a small slice of due process so that he can review, you know, hundreds of thousands of pages of discovery that was dropped on his lap over the last month or so as they continue to race this case to trial. So clearly not going to be being appealed. It sounds like the Court of Appeals are pretty set on making sure this thing goes forward and trial stays on track because the gag order appeal just got denied. Here is what it looked like when this hit the docket. Very short filing. Trump submitted this. It is petitioner versus Mercon. It's an Article 78 petition which is on the order to show cause related to three unconstitutional features of a gag order that was imposed by Judge Mercon. They're asking, this is Trump's defense, for a stay of the proceedings, right? There will be irreparable harm. If Trump cannot speak about this, the election comes and goes. It's over. You don't get to do it again. If there's harm in a criminal trial, you can do it over again. They just say, okay, that cop lied, that prosecutor lied, let's do it again. That juror screwed that up. So let's do it again. 
But in an election season, you don't get a redo. There's no opportunity to come back to this. So they say, we are asking for a stay of these proceedings until we deal with this. Now, the unconstitutional features of the gag order are causing an ongoing irreparable harm to the petitioner. That's Trump. But it's not just Trump. It's us, the voting public under New York and the U.S. constitutions. We're all impacted by this. This came in from Todd Blanche to Matthew Colangelo. We know who that is. He's a Biden, Obama, Tish James, hatchet man. But watch what happens when this stuff goes in, right? Things are very, very quickly decided. So the application for this thing for the interim stay of the proceedings and the pending resolution of the Article 78 proceeding is denied without prejudice to any determination by the full bench. And it sounds like we're going to have maybe another hearing. You can see here some deadlines here on the 15th, right? So uh, April 15th is the same day that jury selection starts in the trial. This was submitted, received by the court on the 8th. So they'll have a follow-up hearing by the full bench. That should looks like look, it'll happen maybe on the 15th. It's being expedited, and the court attorney signed off on it. So court of appeals are denying it, right? And Mershon, Mercon is not going to continue this case. So if the court of appeals are not going to re retract the case from his courtroom, you know, take it away from him, then this thing is going to stay right on track. So Trump appealed again. This was another one that dropped. You can see this one just got filed today. The date of this recording, April 10th, 2024. That one was from the 10th. It's a new set of documents, same type of thing. And what we're finding out is this is like number 10, maybe 11, right? And it's happening so fast, we can't even see them. So the way it works, as you'll learn when you go listen to Good Logic, who we're going to talk about here in a minute, who's filing something similar, has done that already. It happens very quickly. So you file it, they schedule a hearing like the next day, it happens. So by the time this is all, you can see even when the screenshot was taken, it's all still being processed, right? Processed and pending. So it takes a while for it to hit the docket. So something like this was happening today and Adam Klasfeld was reporting on this. He says, Trump's attorneys are currently arguing again to delay his New York criminal trial. And it, I, I call it an adjournment I, because he's entitled due process, but okay, well, we can you know take that up later. This time he's arguing on immunity and other issues. By Bragg's count, that's more than 10 attempts to adjourn the trial so that he can review all of the discovery, access the Stormy Daniels documentary. Remember the Stormy Daniels documentary just came out like on the 19th of March. So there's a lot of material that he needs to review Plus, we're in the middle of an election season, so he's trying to preserve these arguments. So 10 times, you know, any one of these would be a good basis for an adjournment and a stay of the lower level proceeding, but they deny, deny, deny. They're not going to take it. Klasfeld says, okay, on the grounds cited by Trump's lawyer, Emil Bove, shout out, Mercon ordered that the parties must receive permission to file any more 11th hour pretrial motions. The judge says, I'm tired of all your appeals. Stop it. Gah! Bove calls them unacceptable, Your Honor. Trump's defense says, Your Honor, this is unacceptable. We're allowed to file motions. We have to defend our client and do our job as lawyers. There are unconstitutional restrictions on our ability to file defense motions. Judge is like, well, what do I care about the Constitution? I've already unconstitutionally gagged you too. Deal with it. So it, Trump's lawyer pivots to the presidential immunity arguments. He says, Your Honor, Trump's argument here is very different than the one in Washington, D.C. The, the argument here is evidence of official acts. Evidence of official acts cannot be offered at a criminal trial against a former president. And Trump was the president every single time that Michael Cohen sent him a bill it got entered into the spreadsheet, the ledger, the checkbook. And then when it went into, when Trump wrote the check, okay, Michael Cohen started sending the invoices in 2017. Trump was already in the White House. So, you know, you might have a, a disagreement about whether those were official acts or how 
you might criminalize those, but that's Trump's argument, right? And that's the, that's the truth. Trump was the president. So most, most of the 10 requests to adjourn have happened at the lower court level, though Trump is racking up a growing number of attempts at the appellate level as well. Now, Bo pivots to the final ground in Trump's latest request, recusal. And we've read through those filings here, and they were good. If you missed that one, there was a doozy on the most recent one. I think we hit that yesterday. The judge notes, okay, originally, your motion on that issue was decided last August. So that's a long time ago. He's like, I didn't even read it. He's like, I threw that in the garbage as soon as it came in. Get out of here. What's your next question? Trump's lawyer claims that new evidence came to light. Your Honor, you got to read it again. We just learned your daughter literally is working for Joe Biden. So... You should read it again. Bragg says, nah, uh, nah, uh. It was already the same judge. You already decided no take backsies. So, on the delay from the original motion in the appeal, Trump's lawyer Bove says, Your Honor, uh, I don't think it's untimely. Okay. I don't think that's an issue that can ever be untimely. So, like, you can say it's not timely, but we can raise this whenever we want because it's fatal to the entire case. Like, again, it's not like the clock just runs out when there is a total blanket to liability. So sorry. So that's Trump's arguments. Government prosecutor for Bragg comes up. His name's Stephen. He starts off with the argument that these petitions are improper. Yeah, these are timely improper. He says the judge loves the timeliness argument, so they're procedurally improper. And uh, Wu adds that Bove's characterization of the pretrial motions are also patently false. He says, Your Honor, so they're not Mershon's. They're appealing to someone else. They say Mershon also ordered that the parties receive permission to file motions just weeks before the trial date for a reason, so we don't have to be here wasting everybody's time. Trump's attorneys had been, quote, inundating the court with belated filings that were just on the eve of trial, he says. Yeah, they're trying to delay this thing. He makes a point on immunity. He says, this is not a claim that Trump is immune from these charges, and Trump is contesting the admissibility of the evidence, which Wu says is not appealable right now. So Trump is not saying he's immune from the charges. He's saying he's immune from the admission of the evidence. All of the actual official acts were evidence while he was the president. Prosecutor argues that the court shouldn't even consider the recusal because Trump's renewed request remains pending. He also notes that the state ethics committee already cleared you, judge. Your daughter can work for Joe if she wants to. The arguments we're making here, just five days before jury selection, says the prosecutor, is just about to begin have already been adjudicated. And so this has already been dealt with a long time ago. A different attorney for Bragg's office stands up. He says, Your Honor, a trial delay would cause enormous disruption. Security has been planned for months in this trial. Trump's team comes back up. He says, Your Honor, there's an information deficit here that we're witnessing. In proving claims about Mershon and his alleged conflict with his daughter, there's a fact finding that needs to happen here, okay? She's literally working for Trump's opponent and daddy is prosecuting him. That's a problem. Lisa Evans for Bragg's office pops up, says there's no evidence to suggest that Mershon stands to benefit from the outcome of this trial. No, but his daughter does, and that's a benefit to daddy. If your daughter does well, doesn't the father get a benefit from that? So Associate Justice Ellen Gessmer adjourns the proceedings. They turn around. And there was a ruling basically immediately. Klasfeld reported an appellate court again rejects another attempt by Trump's team to delay the start of the criminal trial between lower and appellate court attempts. That's more than 10 attempts by the DA's count. And so the rig prosecution continues. Now, I want to pause, as we mentioned at the top of the show. Our friend Good Logic is fighting a very similar battle on behalf of the press, on behalf of the people, because you know Good Logic. He brings you legal news and analysis covering a lot of the same topics we cover here. And he happens to be in New York. He is a member of the press with a press badge. And he has, in my opinion, a right to access this, not only as a member of the press, but as a member of the public. Trump. Yes, he's gagged, and yes, that limits his right to speak. But part of being an American and part of the First Amendment is the right to receive. If you can't receive anything, then the, the, the speech is meaningless. So we want to hear from the president, and the way that we do that is through the press and through Trump himself bypassing the press. 
And so good logic as a member of the press has done something very awesome and amazing and inspirational. And we're excited that he is pursuing this. And of course, we'll be supporting him and at his back. Here he says, fighting to have Trump's gag lifted in his New York criminal proceeding. I filed this Article 78 proceeding in the New York Appellate Court that the gag violates the First Amendment freedom of press and asks for an emergency TRO. Now I wait for the court to get back to me. Good stuff, right, my friends? And so be sure that you are following good logic because he's going to be going through the proceedings that we just kind of articulated here, right? What Trump is going through, they filed Article 78. He's filing something else, simil- very, you know, basically the similar proceeding, but for a different reason, right? On behalf of free access under the First Amendment and you know, freedom of the press access to a historic case and a historic trial. So doing some very good stuff. He is right next door on YouTube. We're dropping his links in the chat. So be sure you're subscribed to him because tonight he's going to go through it. I think he also posted that he'll be covering this on Locals tonight. And so if you're next door on Locals, 5.30 Eastern time, he's going through it. So you might go check that out. Goodlogic.locals.com. And he's there. He's in New York. He's boots on the ground. So this is the real deal. And we're excited to be supporting him. So go check that out. Now, elsewhere, we have former Trump counsel who is also explaining what he thinks is going to happen in this upcoming criminal trial. Certainly feels like trial is going, so we're planning on it. On starting Monday, we're going to be covering it every single day, trying to recreate what happened there as best we can, even though they try to bury it. But here is Trusty saying, we're just days from this thing, time to get focused, it's go time. It's interesting, and I don't want to get too too far afield in terms of the prior representation, but I think the bottom line is, at some point, you really have to shift into the mode of trial and tactical and not worrying as much about the politics. That's difficult for someone who's running for president right now, but as a lawyer, I think your obligation is to say, look, we got to focus on the task at hand, because this is a triable case, and this is going to be a case where jury selection that Paula just laid out is incredibly important because there's going to be a real incentive for people to want to be celebrity jurors, to be, to find a way to answer the questions in a way, perhaps dishonestly, that gets them into that magic number of 12 jurors. So there's a lot at stake. There's a lot to be focusing on. I think in terms of courtroom decorum, courtroom behavior, because it's such a, a, I think, creative, which really means weak case, you know, relying so heavily on the credibility of Michael Cohen, that even in New York, President Trump has a shot. So I think the lawyers need to focus on trying the case, on cross-examination, on the right arguments to make. And they want to have a client who's respectful in the courtroom so that the jury doesn't have any risk of being alienated by any of that kind of political atmosphere. All right. So Mr. Trusty, Jim Trusty, I think, with some good analysis there, right? Trial's coming up. And a victory at trial would also be a major victory politically, right? If Trump walks into this thing, and he emerges victorious, they are going to be so, so upset about this. I mean, it's going to be a meltdown level 10. And I'm not sure it's going to happen. I think New York is a, largely a foregone conclusion. We saw a lot of that reflected in Trump's surveys that he submitted to the judge when he was seeking a change of venue or an adjournment until after the election. But none of that, of course, has come into play. But we are going to be here continuing to cover this. It is unlikely that the trial does get moved. And so we'll see what happens. Be sure you're checking out Good Logic and his channel, following him and supporting his work because he is fighting hard, my friends, on behalf of the public, the people, we the people. So good stuff over there. We'll be here as well. Don't forget to check out some of the other links down in the description below. We got our locals watching the watchers.locals.com right next door to Joe. We've got our website, robertgovea.com and our lodge, watcherlodge.com, where we're focusing on sovereignty and self-development every Saturday, 1030 Eastern, 1030 Pacific, 130 Eastern, all free, watcherlodge.com. We'd love to have you come and join us so that we can focus on the solutions and our futures together. We'll see you there. We'll see you right back here on the next one. And we got one more segment, my friends. We're not done yet. It's Avenatti time. This was a wild exchange. And so... Let's just, we got some listening to do here and let's get right into it. 
You remember Michael Avenatti, the guy who used to represent Stormy Daniels. They were frolicking around together. We were all wondering what was going on there. Turns out he broke the law. He's in prison. Going to be there for a little bit longer. But he called in on an NBC News show and explained what he thought about the Stormy Cohen brag trial that is scheduled to start on the 15th. And it's a surprising interview because Avenatti is no fan of Donald Trump but he laced into the Bragg prosecution and Cohen's credibility and Stormy's credibility. And even Trump is saying, you know, Avenatti sounded pretty good these days. He posted this on True Social and Avenatti posted this, I guess from prison. He said, we can't be hypocrites when it comes to the First Amendment, you know. It's outrageous that Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels can do countless TV interviews, they can post on social media, they can make money on bogus documentaries, all by talking crap about Trump, but he's gagged and he's threatened with jail if he responds. Trump said, hey, thank you, Michael Avenatti. A good point, dude, for revealing the truth about two sleaze bags who have with their lies and misrepresentations cost our country. And so Michael Avenatti is gonna lace into Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels, and we'll listen to him in a minute, But Trump also posted this, and this was a curious one from Trump. We've talked about this before and seen this before, but on truth, he says, hey, look what I just found. Will the fake news report it? Here's the official statement from Stormy Daniels, January 30th, 2018. She officially released this and she walked it back, but here's what she says. To whom it may concern, Over the past few weeks, I've been asked countless times to comment on reports of an alleged sexual relationship I had with Donald Trump many, many, many years ago. The fact of the matter is that each party to this alleged affair denied its existence in 2006, 2011, 2016, 2017, and now again in 2018. I am not denying this affair because I was paid, quote, hush money as has been reported in the overseas owned tabloids, I am denying this affair because it never happened. I will have no further comment on this matter. Please feel free to check me out on Instagram at the Stormy Daniels. Signed, thank you, Stormy Daniels. Signature. So now she has said, that's not really accurate. That's not true. All of this stuff. Okay, you can be the judge of that because here's even the AP fact checking this. They said, here's a claim. There's a newly classified document shows that Stormy admitted that she never had an affair with Trump. This article was just updated, published March 24th, not long ago, a year ago, like almost a year ago to the day. So here's the missing context. The signed statement with the denial was in fact publicly released, but it was just missing context. Not long after she released that, Daniels, recanted the statement and said that an affair had occurred, okay? Signs it never occurred, leave me alone. I've said this many times. She said her denials were due to non-disclosure agreements that she signed and the statement, she signed the statement because the parties involved made it sound like I had no choice, okay? So that's her. She is just, I guess, the same as Michael Cohen, right? Admits that there was no affair at all. But here is Avenatti, right? He calls in, he's stuck in prison, very irritated about uh, his current conditions. Trial now will be Donald Trump's. And we've got trial coming up any minute. And so Avenatti calls in and he gets asked some questions about uh, how he's doing and some other stuff. And so let's see where we're at. You assess the strength of the prosecution's case. Well, I think what I'm about to say is going to surprise a lot of people, and that is that, um, you know, I think this is the wrong case at the wrong time, Ari. Um, I I think that the case is in many ways stale at this juncture. You're talking about conduct that occurred some eight years ago. Uh, I think the uh, fact that it's occurring in state court in New York uh, is a mistake. Uh, And I think that when you are going to... Uh, potentially deprive tens of millions of Americans uh, of their choice for the presidency of the United States, whether we agree with those folks or not, or regardless of what we may think of Donald Trump, I think it's a mistake to do it based on a case of this nature. Hmm. Um, I, I was hoping, frankly, that 
there would have been less hand-wringing, uh, less bedwetting, and that the January 6th case would have been filed in a more timely manner. There's no excuse or reason as to why that case could not have been brought in 2021, and it should have been brought in 2021. Yeah, many others were. And remember, the Proud Boys have already been convicted and sentenced. And th those were five co-defendants, right? Much broader case. And there was actual, you know, uh, communications and stuff there that they were digging into, like lots of moving parts with the whole organization. Trump, you know, they hit him with five charges and they're all related to his speech, talking to Pence, talking to the governors, talking to other people, talking to the, you know, state officials, alternate electors, all those things. It's not even a complex case, but they delayed it for a reason to time them all up. And then they just botched it because they're not really competent. And had it been brought in 2021, we would not find ourselves in the situation that we're in right now. Now, I know a lot of people have been critical of the United States Supreme Court and uh, as well as the second, uh, not the second, but the D.C. Circuit. Yep. You know, I, I think those complaints are frankly misplaced. And Michael, have you been in touch with D.A. Bragg's office? And what specifically in, in evidence or logic uh, do you think is wrong with this case? Well, I'm going to decline to answer as to whether I've been in touch with, you know, either the defense or um, the D.A.'s office. But, Interesting. But let me say this in response to the second part of your question. You know, I, I, I think the, the case has a lot of problems. Now, that, that does not, I don't mean to suggest that that means that Trump will not be convicted, because I think he York. will be convicted. It's hmm. New York. Because number, because, number one, he's a criminal defendant, and in our society, I don't believe the criminal defendants generally get a fair shake. In fact, I think that the percentage of convictions demonstrates that, that the deck is stacked decidedly against all criminal defendants, um, number one. Number two, I That's don't think true. that he can get a fair trial in New York. And to the people who claim that, in fact, he can get a fair trial in New York with a New York jury, I would ask them if they were to sleep, go to sleep tonight and wake up tomorrow and find out that the case had been moved to Mississippi or Alabama, would they still think that the trial was going to be fair? And I think if they were being honest, they would answer no. So I don't think he can get a fair trial in, in New York. But separate apart from that, I, I think the case does have problems. I mean, number one... I don't know who the narrator witnesses are going to be in the case. And by that, I mean that, that every case needs to have one or two primary witnesses to tell the story. It's got to be Cohen and Stormy. From my perspective, and uh, I surmise that the DA is going to use potentially Michael Cohen or Stormy Daniels gotta for that be. purpose. Um, and, and I think that has the potential to be a disaster. More likely Michael. Uh, Michael Cohen is a – and, you know, I've never been a fan of, of Michael for various reasons. Um, it, you know, he's, he's a serial liar. He's shown himself to be incapable of telling the truth. Convicted um, perjurer. You know, his All legal statements. acumen leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, let's just say that if, you know, if Learned Hand or Clarence Darrow had a love child, it, it certainly wouldn't be someone like Michael Cohen. Trump claims that he just paid retainer money, um, and now it's being prosecuted as Those basically the Trump financial fraud, wrote. lying about the expense. Uh, you have a lot of experience in this case. Is Donald Trump lying when he says it was all going to just be a retainer? Yeah, I, I don't believe that. I've never believed it. And if you go back and look at the interviews, in fact, that you and I conducted back in 2018, I've always scoffed at that and, and thought it was ridiculous. But my point is one just of trial dynamics. Who's going to tell the story? And the problem is, is that if the prosecution relies predominantly on Michael Cohen and, you know, documents don't admit themselves into evidence. You know, I see various legal commentators talk about, well, this is a document case. Well, that may be true to a certain degree, but you've still got to have somebody on the stand that tells the story. And, and to say that Michael Cohen is a, uh, is a problem witness uh, would be an understatement. I, I mean, and, and look, here's the other issue. He literally lied again in court in New York. They just sentenced Weisselberg to, I think, five, six, five months again for apparently committing perjury in the Tish James trial. That's Trump's former CFO. Michael Cohen either lied in Letitia James's prosecution as her star witness, literally in Angeron's court, or lied when he was taking his plea deal to a federal judge. So he has committed perjury again, and they're just overlooking the whole thing. Like, that has to be brought up, right? If that's not brought up, 
because he just, there was a federal order about this, right? It goes to his credibility. It goes to his character for truthfulness. So he's a, a disaster, you know, to have as the primary witness. Now they might have someone else, but the Cohen is the key transactor, right? He's the person who's going to be able to tell us about the nature of the relationship. Sorry. You know, Alina Abba is not going to be trying this case hey, for Donald Trump. Watch it. Now, I don't know how he got him, but he got real lawyers in this hey. case. Hey! And these lawyers know their way around a courtroom. Hey! And I think they're going to have watch an it, absolute bucko. field day with Michael Cohen on the stand. Well, let me ask you so this, then, Michael, because you said some people might be surprised uh, that you, Michael Avenatti, speaking to us today, uh, see all the weakness in this case. I, I do want to remind you that uh, back when you were involved, you said Trump should have liability. You said federal prosecutors in New York should present this material to grand jury for potential indictment of Trump when he was president. Um, so how can you explain uh, going from that then uh, to what you're saying tonight, that you actually think this is a, a, a troubled case? Well, I can explain it this way, Ari, I, and, and you're absolutely right. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in 2018 in October, uh, which predated the criminal investigation into me by about 10 days, coincidentally enough, and I don't believe in coincidences. I wrote that op-ed, and I advocated for the indictment of then-sitting President Donald Trump, and I stand by that 100%. Which is also I advocated dumb. for SDNY federal prosecutors that. in the Southern District of New York to bring campaign finance charges. And by the way, no cogent explanation has ever been provided by anybody as to who made that decision and why they didn't bring those charges either while he was president or immediately thereafter. And I think that's a question that people need to ask. The problem that I have with this case. He's right about that. It is hard to find out why there was no prosecution. There was a guy, his name is escaping me right now, but there was another uh, Southern District of New York attorney who was there and he was there very temporarily. Bill Barr asked him to resign. He didn't resign. Then Trump basically fired him and then he left. And that was kind of the end of it. So it, it's been a weird case, I think probably because it relies on Michael Cohen and Michael Cohen has such a bad record that the SDNY couldn't do anything. Like, what are they going to do with this case? Even if it's a campaign finance violation, they got to tie it back to Cohen. Right. It's it's this is basically a campaign vi finance violation type of a crime. It's like a spreadsheet crime. It is a checkbook problem. You misappropriated uh, uh, something. And so they're it's falsifying a business record. So SDNY said it wasn't there. Their star witness would have had to have been the same guy. Cohen He's now. I have a number of problems. First of all, cases are not like fine red wine. Ari. They don't get better with age. Um, and this case hasn't gotten better with age. Number two, I don't believe this case belongs in state court, and I think it rests on a legally tenuous theory, namely that the crime that was attempted to be covered up was a federal election crime. I think that could be a problem potentially on appeal um, for the state. Um, and number and three, let me slow I you down, and then you'll go to number three. But you're just to be clear, saying that with your knowledge of all of this, if the DA is trying to make this stick as a felony, as a serious matter based on federal rather than state crime, you think that could be a hole in the whole theory of this case? I, I do, and I think it's going to be tested on appeal um, when Trump is convicted. And again, I think he will be convicted. That doesn't necessarily mean um, it's going to hold up. I believe if you're going to bring a case against a sitting president or a former president who tens of millions of people support, especially in today's day and age with how divided we are, I think it needs to be a rock-solid, lock-tight, lock nearly perfect prosecuted case, because otherwise you run a huge risk as to what it's going to mean for the country. And I don't believe this case right now is the case. Yeah, so here is the background on the prosecutor who didn't, uh, that's not the one I wanted, uh, hang on a second. This was, the guy's name is, hang on a sec, where did I do with this? Um, see if it, this will start it here. Okay, this guy. This guy's name is Jeffrey Berman. 
this guy, former U.S. attorney, and this is an article from 2018, 2019, July 18th. Federal prosecutors signaled in court documents on Thursday that it was unlikely they would file additional charges. This is Southern District of New York. So in a document, the prosecutor said they had effectively concluded their inquiry, which centered on payments from 2016. So we don't know exactly what that was, you know, what was the basis for that. So it is strange, but their case obviously wasn't any good. And that's the problem that I have. But I stand behind everything I said in 2018, everything I wrote in that op-ed. Hmm. And, and I remain very concerned that no one has gotten to the bottom of what the hell exactly happened with SD&Y in 2018. Was that decision made by Jeffrey Berman? Was that decision made by William Barr? Who made that decision, and why was it made to turn a blind eye to Donald Trump's yeah. conduct? Well, Michael, you mentioned your history. You also uh, wrote that there are facts and evidence, texts, emails, etc., in the hush money case that have yet to see the light of day that will be, quote, very damaging to the prosecution. Uh-oh. Uh, have those since seen the light of day? What are you Stormy referring to? and Cohen podcasting well, texts? Are they scheduling another interview? You know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to be careful about what's been disclosed and, and who it's been disclosed to. Um, I, I don't know, ultimately, uh, if they will see the light of day during the trial. But, you know, Ari, over the course of the representation, my representation of Ms. Daniels, I came to learn a number of things, unfortunately, uh, from her that turned out to be completely untrue. Uh, and a lot of that is what led me to wow. terminate my representation of her in February of, of 2019. One of the big things that I learned, unfortunately, is that what I had been sold by Ms. Daniels relating to how this payment had came about and what I had subsequently advocated on television and others in reliance on what she had told me turned out to be completely false. Wow. Uh, it had been represented to me that she had not attempted to extort Donald Trump uh, and the campaign in the waning days of 2016, that they had come to her. Uh, and I believed her when she told me that repeatedly. Trump came to Unfortunately, her. Unfortunately, in early 2019, I came to learn that that was not true. Does it matter to the legal case who initiated it? She went to Trump, right? She says, I'm going public or else, unless you give me money. Not Trump going to her to clean up loose ends. So he's calling Stormy a liar. She lied to me. I dropped her as a client. If, uh, as you said earlier tonight, Donald Trump still lied about it and potentially lied to the government about it. I don't think from a legal perspective it matters, but okay. I think very well from an optics standpoint it could matter. And again, I believe he'll be convicted in the case, but I don't think it's going to move the needle to the degree that some people believe that it will. I think a lot of this is already baked into the analysis relating, for instance, to the campaign. I mean, I've seen the polls and I've seen the, the, the pundits talk about that if he's criminally convicted, it's going, to, uh, it's going to be meaningful as it relates to the presidential election. I don't think that's going to be true if he's convicted in this particular right. case. Let me ask you this. And I agree with that. And we made that point that, you know, they keep saying, well, the reason we have to prosecute Trump, the reason why we're shattering 234 years of American history in order to do this is because we've never had a president who's acted so egregiously like this. And you say, what? Wait a minute, what? No president has ever, you know, uh, paid off someone before, you know, or engaged in a contract to settle a claim or something like this? Like, give me a break. We have Bill Clinton. Hello? And you say, well, they just got, didn't get caught, right? And so I guess there's a uh, justification that Trump should be prosecuted because he got caught, because it's a political prosecution. And by the way, like this case is from 2016, 17 payments. So why did they bring it a long time ago? Well, because it was rejected by Cyrus Vance, wasn't actually brought back. Even Alvin Bragg rejected it until Matthew Colangelo came over from the DOJ and from Biden. And then this whole case got resurrected again. So there's you know, a lot of illegitimacy, Ill Ill illegitimacy with this from the very beginning. Michael, you've thrown some cold water on what some people thought was a strong case here. And, and you've also given your analysis of what may happen and we'll all be watching. Uh, at the same time, 
you have implied that your treatment uh, by the then Barr and Trump Justice Department uh, was harsher than other people may have uh, been dealt with if they weren't in your position. You had become for a time a very prominent foe of then President Trump. Um, do you say tonight that, that there is evidence that you were treated differently? And if so, does that mean anything for what a second term Trump DOJ might look like? Are if you, you were afraid elected? he's going to indict you harder this I, I time? I don't believe there's any question that I was treated differently. And I believe that if anyone is asked that honestly and looks at what happened here, and if they're honest in their answer, I believe that they would answer the same way that I have. Ari, uh, I was indicted in three separate cases within 54 days. The government proceeded to stack these sentences on top of one another. Look at this one. Paraplegic client settlement money stolen. Avenatti charged trying to extort Nike, 25 million. Avenatti charged stealing 300 grand from Stormy Daniels. I was not treated fairly and I was treated um, differently. And I firmly believe and will go to my grave believing uh, that one of the reasons, the reason I was treated in this fashion was because I was the biggest enemy uh, of Donald Trump in 2018. There's no question about that. And I was also his most dangerous enemy. And finally, what do you say to people listening tonight who think, well, even if that's the case and there was differential treatment, uh, you still were caught and at times expressed, uh, you know, contrition. Uh, for crimes and crimes related to dishonesty. Why should people take your word on any of this tonight? Well, because I think I demonstrated over a significant period of time and over a couple decades um, of legal work that I've done a lot of good, uh, that a lot of what I've said is checked out, uh, that I generally have not trafficked in nonsense. There's no question, Ari, that I made mistakes. There's no question uh, that I exercised poor judgment uh, at times. Uh, but no question that I exercise poor judgment at times, uh, but I, I think people need to ask yourself or themselves, are you really going to define somebody by the worst thing they did in their life, or are you going to look at the totality of the body of their work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was getting curious to see if he was going to say something like, I didn't do what I did, you know, because the judge might have a problem with that if he's sitting in uh, custody. Certainly say, oh, you didn't. That's weird, because did you take a plea ge a deal for any of this stuff? Oh, that's curious, because you said you did do the thing. So anyways, very curious very curious interview from Avenatti, basically saying that Stormy is not credible, confirming this story that there is a belief that Trump went to her to clean this thing up, but sounds like maybe she went to him to try to extort him out of money and he just paid to make it whole, the whole thing go away, given the fact that he just got elected to be the president, don't need to deal with any of this stuff. So Trump responded to this lawfare everywhere in New York and elsewhere said the White House thugs should not be allowed to have these dangerous and unfair Biden trials during my campaign for president. All of them, civil and criminal, could have been brought more than three years ago. It's an illegal attack on a political opponent. It's communism at its worst and election interference at its best. No such thing has ever happened in our country before. On Monday, I will be forced to sit gagged before a highly conflicted and corrupt Judge Mercon whose hatred for me has no bounds. All of these New York and DC quote judges and prosecutors have the same mindset. Nobody but this Soro prosecutor, Alvin Bragg, wanted to take this ridiculous case. All legal scholars say it was a sham. Biden's DOJ is running the case, just think of it. These animals want to put the former president of the United States who got more votes than any sitting president and the party's Republican candidate in jail for doing absolutely nothing wrong. It is a rush to the finish so unfair and it's true. So, you know, when they say that Trump is, uh, you know, e egregious and to finish my earlier point that he is, he is stepping outside. This is breaking the norm. You know, that is not, you know, th this is not like the others, right? This case is New York, New York, the, the, the Manhattan's prosecutor's office, they have such a bad record they were in there trying to get better deals for Epstein, all right? They were in there trying to suppress evidence against uh, Weinstein, against victims, like they were supporting Weinstein. So they don't come out and say that they're all, you know, uh, high and mighty on contracts to suppress stories in New York. It's New York. So they're obviously singling him out, targeting him, and they have some of the worst people to make their case. 
They've got Michael Cohen already convicted of felonies, Stormy Daniels, who already put out a statement saying none of this ever happened, and Avenatti, who is in prison, saying that they're both unreliable and, you know, idiots. So the trial is seemingly going on Monday, my friend. So we're going to be here covering it. Hopefully you join us as we do. Thank you so much for subscribing wherever it is you're watching this. Thanks for liking this video, for sharing some content with a friend or family member who may not have seen it before so that they can come over here and join us as we dig into this. We've got some pretty good plans to cover the trial, and I think there's going to be a lot to unpack together. So thank you for joining us as we do. Thank you also for checking out watchingthewatchers.locals.com, which is our members-only community where we do live streams in the morning and on Saturdays. We already did a live stream here today, and we had a great time doing it. We have an amazing community. We talk about other things that we can't get to here. We'd love to see you come and join us at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Have some fun, and it's a great way to support our work here as well. So thanks for joining. Thanks for seeing us over there and for joining us back here on the next one. All right, my friends. Well, that is it for us on the day. We covered some good ground. Avenatti blasting the Bragg prosecution. Trump fighting the rigged trial start date. 10 plus appeals to just get a modicum of due process. We'll see if he gets it. And Judge Cannon rips Jack Smith, says, you know, I'm going to grant some of your requests, but you're kind of an idiot. So now, my friends, it's time to hear from you and to see what you have to say on this amazing Wednesday. I hope your week is unfolding very nicely and you're accomplishing all of the things. Hey, we missed this one yesterday. Jim R. in the USA sent this one in. And this one says, Rob, Brazil and others will use lawfare like Biden. Yeah, and I think our country is probably going to also look more like Brazil, especially if Joe Biden wins again. Jim R. in the USA, Membo for eight months. Great to have you, Jim R. Thanks for being a Membo. Thanks for supporting us one month. And then we got a baby in the house. Thanks again, Jim. This one came in from Angel. What's up, Angel? Over on Locals says, Happy Hump Day from Gainesville, Georgia. Trump 2024. Stop child and satanic trafficking. Yes, I endorse that message. Chops, stop child and satanic trafficking. Yes, ab absolutely. Good, good comment on that. So shout out to our friends from Gainesville, Georgia and Angel. Thank you so much for being over on Locals and for the nice, lovely message today. Hey, travel agent Amy, who is actually a travel agent and she's amazing. We've sent some emails back and forth. She's like, are you going to go on a cruise yet? I'm like, oh, I can't, you know, it's election season. But if you need a good uh, travel agent, if you need a cruise guide, travel agent Amy is yours, not a man. Travel advice says travel over to locals and join. You won't regret it. Speaking of travel advice, uh, travel agent Amy has your first ticket right over to locals. Thank you, Amy. We got, see, uh, Rob says on Rumble says Biden is not on the general election ballot in Ohio and Alabama. The Dems are so focused on getting Trump, they're going to lose the election by default. Democrat fake mail-in ballots are printed already. I saw the story. Is it official? I thought he was like in the danger zone, at least in Ohio. Alabama will go red. I don't think he needs to worry about that. But Ohio, that would be a big problem. CGI Joe is here. What's up, CGI Joe? Bringing in 10 Membos. Look who's coming in. We've got Gail G, Line Theory, Linda H, Eugene N, Renee B, Jill C, Chris is here, Aaron R, Anvil S, and Brian B. All coming in courtesy of CGI Joe, gifted, gifted 10 Membos in the house. What's up? We got this one from Linda H, seven months as a Membo. Says, thanks for gifting me, Joe. Hey, that's sweet. Joe, high five to Joe. And Four Leaf Clover, shout out. Linda Hunter, Membo for seven months with the real handsome boy in the photo. Ravicus is in the house as, hey, hey, just got a badge today. I don't even know what for. It's for being amaz amazing, Ravicus, because you deserve it, my friend. I'm not sure what it's for either, but you deserve it. Good to see you, Ravicus. Thanks for the dono, my friend, on Locals. Hey, what's up, Greg K? Greg says, how about some likes, people? Hey, thanks, Greg, for the reminder. You know, I appreciate you guys liking the video. So does Greg. Thanks, Greg. We got this one from Simon Raven says, hi from the UK. Can Trump not take all his cases to SCOTUS and say, please look at this in its totality as that's where you see how crazy it is. 
Um, I mean, not really. Like, are you saying, so first of all, we're there in some cases. So we've already made our way there on the January 6th case. When we're talking about the state state level, where we, you appeal through the state court of appeals, right? So Trump would have to bypass that. He could always file, I think, an original action at SCOTUS, but like that's not gonna bring him any solution in New York or in the, like for the Fannie Georgia case and for the Trump New York case, the normal route to the Supreme Court is up through the state court. So state, lower court, court of appeals, Supreme Court, then SCOTUS. So Trump's not there yet in either place. And in the Florida case, depending on some of Cannon's rulings, maybe he takes that one up to the Supreme Court as well. But the J6 case is up at SCOTUS right now. So maybe they'll get there, right? And maybe they'll come out and grant presidential immunity and call it, we'll call it a day. Sarah, what's up, Saraf? Saraf's over on the YouTubes. Says Trump should speak freely despite the gag order. Yeah, I don't know. You know, we're going to, we would get into a very precarious position pretty quickly. Maybe he will. Maybe we'll see. Maybe we'll see something happen after this trial starts to unfold. And we'll see what the judge does. It could be a very, very sticky situation. Judge says, you're going to jail. Take him into custody. Whoa. Whoa. That's like code red. If that happens. Good to see you, Saraf. Five months as a membo. Thanks for being a membo, my man. Hey, Viva Maga. What's up, Viva Maga? Bringing in 10 membos. Look at this one. Chris C's coming in. Michelle P, a pear tree is in. April F, Kim A, Anthony, Yukon, Trip House, Amanda W, and R England. All in the house, courtesy of Viva Maga. Bringing in 10 new membos. We got Wink HVAC. What's up, Wink HVAC? No membo, but a very nice dono. Thank you for that, Wink. We got Johnny Reb over on Rumble says, Good logic. The man, the myth, the legend. Joe Nearman. Good logic. Good to see you, Johnny. You're right. It's true. Dolphin fan is the man bringing in five new membos. Tam Tam was here. Tack Pay. We got Timothy F. Betsy's here and Jeff H. All coming in courtesy of Dolphin fan is the man bringing in five new membos. We got, what's up, Fred Petamonte says Trump fired Jeffrey Berman. Yeah, that's true. He did. Yeah, they asked him to resign and then he didn't really resign. And then he left. Yeah, weird situation there. Gordon B, what's up, Gordon B says the judge in the YSL trial went ballistic over a late motion. That trial has been bonkers, man. That young thug trial. That's the one you're referencing, right? It's been wild. Total bananas there. Hey, Viva Maga says TLA, AKA the lead attorney on YouTube. Shout out to the lead attorney doing great content over there. Had Jocelyn Wade's lawyer, Andy Hastings on this morning. Oh, and dropped some big bombs on Nathan's hot dog and big fanny. Oh no, it is a must watch. Nate was cheating back in 2009 and most likely prior. What a piece of work. And now he's abandoning his son in Spain. Good luck coming home, son. Hasta luego, amigo. We got Rob White says Hillary Clinton got a campaign finance violation. Well, she did a bunch of bad things and nobody cared because she was part of the entourage. Chubby Stubbies here says the only reason Avenatti is speaking up in defense of Trump is because he sees the writing on the wall. Trump is projected to win in 2024. Avenatti's trying to get brownie points. So he's like, can I get a pardon, please, over here? Can I come work for you? <laughs> I see what you're saying. Thanks, Chevy. Hey, Cowboy Rob says, are you going to do a show on Alex Jones' CIA lawsuit? So I didn't even know he was filing one. Is he suing the CIA? Or is the CIA coming after Alex Jones? Is it finally happening? Are, did they come get him? CIA, come get him. Well, we're going to fight for Alex, okay? So if there's a lawsuit, we're going to fight for Alex. I don't actually, I'm just joking. I don't know what the lawsuit is, but yeah, I mean, I love CIA lawsuits and Alex Jones. So I'd be happy to do it. If it's, if it's, you know, worthy of what we talk about here. Unwoke thought says I've got 10 K on Trump being convicted in this hush money case. Anyone want to take me up on it? No, no, that would be a ridiculous bet. Obviously 
you want to make $10,000? It's a good way to do it. If you find someone, good luck to them. Flash River says, watching the watchers is absolutely the boom, baby. Thank you, Rob, for the awesome analysis. Thank you, Flash. For being a Membo Flash, always so supportive. Thank you for that. I do feel like we're booming it up. We do boom it out over here, that's for sure. Hey, what's up, Jennifer? Says, any news on Mr. Kelly's trial lately? You know, no, I have not cotton up to speed on that, to be honest with you. George Allen Kelly, she's referencing the Arizona rancher. The last we heard on this was, I think, last week. Today's Wednesday already. It's like, oh my gosh, where's the week going? But last we heard, there was no ballistics, okay? Like, the bullet went through the guy. So they don't know what the bullet is, the ballistics are. They just say he was the one who did it. So the case is very, very messy. I'm not sure how much longer it's going or if there's been a disposition or what, but uh, John McGarvey knows everything. He's uh, John McGarvey knows everything on this case. He's been following it to the T. Yeah, some people saying feeling a little bit, uh, you know, iffy on it right now. So, all right, well, maybe we'll hit that tomorrow on the Membo stream. I'll, I'll poke around and see if there's any stories on it. But I'm very interested in the case. It's just tough to cover all the things we want to cover here. So we've been trying to hit some of that stuff in the Membo streams. But thank you, Jennifer. NY says, in a future deal to bail out New York City from economic ruin, Juan Mercan may be served up as the sacrificial lamb. This trial will certainly make sure Trump is elected. You mean like he, you know, he just gets thrown out of office, in other words, because of the damage that's been caused from these maniacs? Yeah, I can see it. Cowboy Rob says, yes, couldn't he file an action this SCOTUS for election interference by the Biden administration? Yeah, he could. I mean, he could. The question is, would SCOTUS accept it? And how would they rule? And would they intervene? But yeah, I mean, Trump could certainly file it. It's just, you know, is it going to go anywhere? And the likelihood of that is probably are, uh, you know, low, honestly. I don't know that they'd interfere. They want it to come up through the regular, you know, the regular mechanism. So maybe they'll file something. We could wake up on Monday. They'll file something with SCOTUS for an emergency order. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if they did. Roger N says, I love how many people's first super chats are on watching the watchers. Oh yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. When it says first super chat, you know, on the screen, it's like, Hey, first super chat. It's like, Hey, you know, yeah, it's nice to, it's nice to share an experience together. You know, thanks for making us your first, you know, all right. We got cowboy Rob. Thank you for that. Roger Needham bringing in five more members, including Liquid Rock Aquatics in the house, man. That sounds awesome. Liquid Rock Aquatics. Aquatics are cool. Andrew D. Melody's coming in. Sub Um Circus is here. And Carol are all gifted members, courtesy of our friend Roger Needham in the house. And my friends, thank you so much for those very generous donos. Welcome aboard to all the new members, new YouTube members. You can also join our Telegram link. I don't mention it a lot, but you can join us on Telegram. You can navigate over to the community tab section, scroll all the way down quite a bit. You'll see Telegram link, our private members only Telegram group where the chat never ends. It just goes on and on, my friends. And so we are going to say what's up to our friends on X before we go over to watching the watchers.locals.com for our members only after party to debrief and hang out a bit and see what's cooking over there. But on X. Who's joining us on the day? A couple comments. John Cobb says, breaking news, a historian uncovered a lost page to the Constitution. It says all of the rules apply to everybody in the whole world except Donald Trump. I rem yeah, yeah, I think I saw that story. What's up, Days? Russ says, so Common Sense asks, why are convicted perjurers allowed to give any evidence at all? A Azok says, it looks how your scales way to the left over here. That's because justice is unbalanced right now, right? Justice is unbalanced. Although that's a little bit too unbalanced. It's kind of blending into the, I got to fix it. I'll work on it. Hey, V is never silent. Says great stream. Great show. UNC Tar Heel fan says Stormy and Cohen are incredible. That's the end. And you could of course follow other watchers out there on the X, connect with other people out there in the wild and like their comments as well. My friends, that is it for us on the day. We are going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Come over and join us. We do streams in the morning, streams on Saturday, and after parties after the show. That's where we're going now. We also have robertgovea.com. 
where you can download PDFs, you can sign up for the newsletter, you can share various show reports that are over there. You can access the merch store. We also have a calendar now, so you can add the calendar to your phone, to your personal calendar. So the show pops up, hey, come watch the show with the links and everything. So check that out. And of course, definitely come join us at, at watcherlodge.com, our new sovereignty and self-development community. We talk about a lot of problematic things that are happening in this country. We want to be a part of the solution, maybe not for everybody, but certainly for ourselves, our families, and our communities so that we're sovereign, free, and anti-fragile moving into the future. We got Sovereignty Saturday. Every Saturday, it's free. Come join us. We're talking about fun stuff. So we'll see you over there. But my friends, that is it for us on the day. Before we wrap up and go over to Locals, we want to thank our mods and our meme smiths who mod down the fort for us and keep things nice and orderly. Our friends, Donut Mind Me, Economy Pilot, Dog Digger, Janek in the house, Zach Nichols, we got Ronnie Cole, our friend, Playing Hooky, Just Cause, and K-Bean, all modding the fort down for us, keeping things nice and orderly in the chat. We got our meme smith, Sleepy Dog Lee, Nathan N810, and Ajigam Gigam modding the fort, memeing the fort down for us, and so we're grateful for everybody who helps keep this thing nice and orderly. My friends, that is it for us on the day. We are going to leave it there and head on over to Locals. We'd love to see you join us, but if not, that's okay because tomorrow we are going to be back here to get into it again and there's going to be a lot that we need to review and we need to see you right back here so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.